you for, well, thank you for the kind introduction and for inviting me. So my name is Matthew Howard and I'm from King's and the work I'm talking about today is sponsored by the EPRC, the AHDB and also Vitacress and I have representatives of Vitacress here as well. Um, so the topic that I want to talk about is automation through grower reprogrammable robots and I think it fits in quite nicely with the discussion we had just before lunch. Uh, because we're very much interested in the skills of people who might potentially be using uh, robots in a horticultural, agricultural setting. So our kind of philosophy is to, is to put the growers in the driving seat, essentially, when it comes to, um, you know, uh, robotic systems. Um, uh, so, yeah, just something about where I come from. So uh, I'm from King's. This is actually a view from uh, one of the meeting room windows, and you can see a few nice landmarks like the London Eye and, and Big Ben. Um, so I'm a central London-based uh, researcher, and at King's I lead the Robot Learning Lab. So we uh, are primarily interested in understanding human motor control. So I always say this is like a summary of, of, um, of our research. We look at how people control their muscles and their bodies, uh, and try to you know, take understanding from that and control advanced robotic systems. So you might be sitting there thinking, well, you know, this is a guy who's, who's based in central London. There's not much farming going on there and he's interested in people not plants so you know what has he got to do with with uh, horticulture well I would argue that there are a lot of good reasons to care about humans in horticulture so we've been visiting lots of different grower sites around the UK and we've uh, been looking at what kinds of automation is actually being currently used and you see in in some large sites so these are actually some snapshots from around Vitacress uh, you do see automation of some things, so there's a potting machine, for example, but for the vast majority of tasks, you still have a lot of people manning these machines. Um, and the reason, you know, there's various reasons for this, I think they're good reasons. Um, one of the major things is, is handling plant material is difficult for robots, and that's why everybody's, I think, today is saying, well, you know, maybe not in the next five years, uh, we'll have a robot doing that. Plants are delicate. They're variable, they're living objects, they, you know, they're just really hard to, to model and um, you know, do the traditional engineering that you need for robotics. Um, but there's also a lot of other practical uh, practicalities that you have to deal with when you're a grower. One of them is that if you want to invest in a large piece of equipment, then you know, that's a big major investment. And from, from the statistics, basically about 90% of UK horticulture businesses are, are small or medium-sized businesses. So if, you, if you're going to invest in something like this as a potting machine, then you need to know that you're going to get a good return on your investment. And I remember last time I came down to the, to the Plant to Grow conference, I met some growers who said, well, I've invested in a potting machine one year, which, which, which put, uh, put soil into polystyrene pots. Great. And then the next year, the retailer said, well, we don't like polystyrene pots because our customers don't want these non-environmentally friendly things. That's a big chunk of money down the drain. So rather than doing that kind of thing, we want to have, um, sorry, we want to have sort of generalized, uh, generally capable uh, automation. Skills and workforce are also massive drivers. So uh, we've already heard about the living wage and of course Brexit. And I think we haven't heard so much today, but I've, I've heard this a lot is that it's unappealing to the young. Um, to work in this kind of uh, industry. So getting people involved with digital skills, I think, actually is also a good driver to, to encourage people to, to participate. So where are their solutions? So one of the big things that has kind of come out of robotics in the last five years are collaborative robots. Let me just turn the sound off on this. So this is me playing around with one of these things. Um, this is a robot that is designed to be inherently safe. So you can actually get up close and personal with it uh, and you, you know, don't have to worry about it crushing you or crashing into you or causing you some kind of industry, uh, in, in, injury. Uh, and I would say that you may be thinking, well, that looks like a fancy arm. That's probably quite expensive. Actually, it's not so bad. So this particular arm will cost you about £30,000 at the current rate. So if you think about that against the, the salary cost of a worker for, or, or for a year, then after a couple of years, you might get payback on that kind of robot. So then the next question is, what are these things actually capable of doing? Can they do something useful around, uh, around a nursery? Well, one of the great things about having a collaborative robot that you can get close to is that you can teach it how to do things. 
So you can do things which are traditionally quite hard with an industrial robot. Here what we're doing is we're teaching this robot how to pick up these little cherry tomatoes off a desk. And you can see all the demonstrator did was press a button to say, OK, learn this, showed him the skill, that, you know, showed the robot the skill, and then the robot, you know, press another button, remember that, learn, and then the robot is able to reproduce that skill. He will eventually get the tomato in the cup. There you go. So, so that's, uh, that's going on at the moment, and there's a huge amount of work in the AI and the machine learning uh, community to, to try to make that uh, more robust and more practical uh, and so on. Um, so this is a, a little video again of, of how this might work in practice. So one of the key things in this, in this area is not being able to exactly replay the same skill that you um, demonstrated to the robot, but actually to get it to cope with situations that it hasn't seen before. So for example, here we're teaching this robot how to pick up these plants and put them in the green kind of bin there. You know, it's like a, like a grading or collation type task where you're discarding plants that you don't want. And rather than demonstrating to this robot, well, this is how you do the picking task for every single possible location of a plant in this, uh, in this seed tray, we're going to show it a few of these locations, and then from that we're going to say, okay, learn, and try to figure out what you need to do if you, if you see a plant in a location that you haven't seen before. Uh, we're just going to sp speed that up. And so what he's doing here, the robot is actually collecting the trajectory data of how the hand should move in order to, to do these picking tasks. So the dramatic last one. And from that, that kind of data, we can, again, apply machine learning methods to get nice, smooth, uh, trajectories, this is predicting what kind of movement the robot should be doing to be able to pick up from all the other locations. And then later on, there's a demonstration of the robot actually uh, picking the, the plant from a, from a previously unseen location. So the core thing here is that you're not just recording and playing back the movements, but you're actually generalizing. You're being able to uh, <coughs> cope with a situation that you haven't seen before. Now, when we've uh, looked at this, we've actually started to look at how this might work uh, on-site in a real growing uh, situation. Again, this is a, a, a task of discarding plants that are un unhealthy, for example, from a seed tray. And, um, and we've been looking at actually how real nursery growers cope with this kind of thing, right? Because if you're going to install this robot into a, into a nursery, then you want to, to see if they're going to be skilled enough to, to use it. So we set up, uh, again, uh, uh, an experiment where we, we did this kind of, we got the nursery growers to do this kind of teaching. We've done some very minor modifications to the robot hand to make it a little bit easier to pick up these plant plugs. And the, the results were quite interesting. So there's a real sort of separation between skills in these growers. So they had no prior experience working with robots in this, in this nursery. Uh, and we found that we had a great diversity of skills. So some people decided, so if you look at these, these plots, these little crosses are the locations of the plants, and these blobs here are the locations where the person did a demonstration. Okay? And this side, this is what the robot would do afterwards. Okay? So some people would demonstrate a certain few, few locations, and you can see here they've generally clustered all the demonstrations towards the top of the, the seed tray, but... Uh, when that comes to, when you use that data for the robot, it learns a pretty poor skill, so it misses a lot of the targets down at the bottom. Some people, on the other hand, were able to uh, give good demonstrations across the whole tray. In this case, the person only gave four demonstrations, and they basically got a full reproduction from the robot. So there's a crucial thing here about how do we train and we skill people in order to be able to use this kind of technology. It's not that hard, but it's something that people don't really think about. I want to flag a few other <coughs> activities that we've got going on in the domain of, of horticulture. So we currently have a project running alongside Vitacrest trying to uh, look at the problem of singulating herbs. So here we're, we're sort of showing off a little uh, sort of early attempt at this where we're trying to get a single sprig of rosemary from the pile there. And uh, you can see it's not that easy. So the, the robot is actually copying the person's hand there 
There's motion trackers embedded into that gardening glove. And you can see that after a fair amount of trial and error and, and, and wiggling the thing around a bit, I hope that we will eventually come out with a single sprig of rosemary. <laughs> Fantastic. So when you see that kind of video, you say, well, I'm not going to replace humans anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> but it, on the other side, it does say, well, you know, this kind of robot hand is capable of doing that, at least. And we hope that as that project develops, we'll, we'll be a lot more efficient. Going further, things to look out for in the future, I think, uh, are not only demonstrating things like positional movements and forces, but also looking at how people are controlling their muscle activity, because the way that you control your muscles uh, depends on how, well, determines how soft you are and how you are able to manipulate delicate objects. So I think Martin spoke earlier about the type of robot system that implements that ability, a soft robot system. So we also need to be able to gather data about how humans are controlling their softness and how we can transfer that onto robotic systems. Um, another thing that also hasn't been mentioned but I think is a driver in terms of uh, workforce uh, recruitment and uh, retention is looking at their welfare. So Working in, in a horticultural production plant for a general nursery worker is, is pretty hard labor, I think. So we're, we're also looking at how you can build in sensors that are able to measure things about how, like the ergonomics of tasks. So for example, this is a, uh, a motion capture sleeve that we've got developed that, that actually measures the muscle activity. So if you're gonna be doing a lot of reaching all day long, you can tell when your worker is gonna get fatigued, whether you might want to change your workstation to make it easier for that person to be more efficient. And you can also, if you're, if you're really uh, hard-nosed about this, you might be want to wanting to measure their production line efficiency and so on. So that's another sort of area that's, that's potentially interesting. Um, staying on that idea of recruiting young people, another thing that we've, we've been running at King's for a couple of years now are um, workshops aimed at school kids. So this was actually a workshop with A-level students where they were building a, a vertical farm out of Lego and basically these are little simulations of plants and we can get the, ro the, get the kids to program the robot and design the robot so they can go around and pick out um, these kind of simulated uh, plants. So they go different colors if they're ripe or, or, or um, unhealthy or whatever. So to sort of briefly kind of summarize, you know, pun fully intended, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, I think, in terms of automation in this sector. And despite some of the pessimism we've heard today, there are robotic solutions that I think can do some things around the nursery already, which are not being used. And I think that there are price points which are not infeasible, such as the red robot arm. I don't think that's too uh, far off a reasonable price point. Um, but for us, Putting power in the hands of the growers is key. So you guys as growers, you're the, you the people who really know your businesses and what needs to be done. So if we can let you innovate, I think that's better than if we kind of stand there and tell you what to do. And yeah, from a technical side, I think that things like artificial intelligence approaches like programming administration, this needs advances in algorithms, but it also needs a consideration of usability and train, training for people to use this. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.